Good morning. Hi, I'm Michael Wasilenko. I'm the interim dean of the Maxwell School at Syracuse University. And along with Will Freeman, who is the president of Public Agenda, I, th I thank you for being with us today. I'd like to acknowledge a few special guests who are with us today. Uh, Louis Urbinus. Benius is the uh, president of the Ford Foundation. Uh, Mitch Wallerstein, who was the, uh, my predecessor dean at the Maxwell School, is here. He's now president of Baruch College. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge the generous support of Louise and Bernard Palitz. Uh, unfortunately, they could not be with us today, but, but they have uh, funded this for a b policy breakfast for five years now, and uh, it's met with some great success. I'd also like to thank the Ford Foundation for providing us with this beautiful home for our breakfast series. Um, and the incoming dean of the Maxwell School, Jim Steinberg, who is now deputy, deputy secretary of the U.S. State Department, has told me to send his regards to all of you. He will be uh, coming in July, uh, starting a job, and uh, I'm looking forward to working with him. Now let me introduce our gifted interviewer. Robert Siegel is the senior host of National Public Radio's All Things Considered. And Robert's also been with us from the beginning of this policy breakfast series. He's an award-winning journalist with a National Public Radio for over three decades. <clears throat> he started his professional radio right here in New York at uh, WRVR Radio following graduation from Columbia University and Stuyvesant High School. Robert has reported from all over the world on every issue you can imagine, and no one does it better than he does. We're very fortunate to have him as a regular moderator for our series, and uh, now let me turn it over to you, Robert, and you can introduce David Brooks. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, hi. I guess my mic is on. Uh, it's rather, rather sh shrill. I should explain that uh, before uh, David Brooks became a columnist for the New York Times, uh, and before he became uh, Mark Shields' uh, partner on the PBS NewsHour on Fridays. Uh, he was a regular Friday guest on NPR's All Things Considered, and for more years than I can recall, uh, I have been sharing in the duties of capping up, uh, wrapping up the week in politics with David Brooks and his partner E.J. Dion, who have been there uh, uh, forever. It's been uh, uh, great fun for me to look forward to on Friday every week. Uh, it's also been my pleasure to read David's columns uh, in the Times, before that his articles uh, in the Weekly Standard and in the Atlantic, uh, and also his books, uh, uh, one of which we'll talk about a bit uh, today, the most recent one, Social Animal. Uh, my other favorite, I should just point out, the, uh, the, about the Bobos, the uh, 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 bourgeois bohemians, it's a phrase that hasn't uh, caught on as well as the red state, uh, the uh, blue state, red state, paradigm that David wrote about uh, uh, for the Atlantic. Uh, but if we were in France, we'd all be talking about les bobos all the time. David, David has contributed a term to French uh, public discourse, and I actually saw a very funny music video about it uh, uh, the other day. Uh, David Brooks is a graduate of the University of Chicago. Uh, he grew up, uh, he was born in Toronto, uh, but grew up in part right down here in Stuyvesant Town, where I grew up, uh, and then uh, went to high school near Philadelphia, where he uh, uh, gained a great deal of material that he cited in many in many books and columns. He is one of the most uh, insightful and I think surprising uh, columnists writing today, if not the most, and to many readers, one of the most frustrating because conservative readers can't understand why he isn't more conservative and liberal readers cannot understand why he's conservative in the first place. Uh, <laughs> perhaps he can shed a little bit of light on this uh, as he is now our guest for this Maxwell Breakfast. David, please join me. Can I, can I describe my French book tour in 30 seconds? <laughs> yes. So I get there, uh, this is for Les Bobo, and I, uh, they asked me to pose naked in a bathtub full of milk for French Vogue, which I said no to. Uh, and then I'm on a, t a talk show on TF1 at one of the French big stations, and they decide I'm so boring. Uh, at they, uh, th one of the rock bands I'm on with during the show gets off, uh, gets under the table and starts taking off my shoes and socks while I'm talking. <laughs> uh, and then another, I feel a hand reaching up my shirt, unbuttoning my buttons one at a time. I just keep babbling on. But like David Hasselhoff, I'm bigger in France than here. <laughs> so was that one of the moments uh, that contributed to your, your insight in the social animal that perhaps we are not such reasonable, rational creatures <laughs> uh, as we think and perhaps we're guided by more uh, emotional and uh, less 
<laughs> those controlled impulses. No, that, that came, I, I came to writing about emotion strictly through the studies. <laughs> so I came by, by reason, led me to emotion. Uh, and my, uh, my wife jokes that me writing a book about emotion is like Gandhi writing a book about gluttony. It's not my <laughs> natural thing. Uh, and I've, I told Robert that joke on NPR, so I'm, very, I'm repeating it here. It's long enough. Uh, well, oh, well, it's okay. been enough time. Again. The other apocryphal brain research story, I can't remember if I mentioned this, uh, it's in the book, which is they took a bunch of middle-aged guys, put them in an fMRI machine, and had them, had them watch a horror movie, and then had them describe uh, their feelings toward their wives. And in both cases, the brain scans were exactly the same, <laughs> just sheer terror. Uh, so I get that. Uh, but essentially, you know, there's just been this revolution in understanding of ourselves. And in 1995, according to a friend of mine who's a neuroscientist named Antonio Damasio, they had uh, no panels among, at the big conventions on emotion. And now I'd say about half or two-thirds of the panel are on emotion. And that's because they've understand, in large part because of Damasio's work, the centrality to emotion, that we have this idea that emotion is over here and reason is over here, and that when one is up, the other is down, and they're separate. And they, actually, last week I was at Harvard debating some neuroscientists, and a lot of them still had this instinct. They knew it rationally that emotion is the foundation for reason. But they had trouble putting the two systems together. But basically what emotion does is it assigns value to things. It tells you what you want. When you look at something, you, you will react with a desire for it or an aversion to it with an admiration for it or contempt to it. And if you don't have that emotional repertoire, then you uh, can't make rational decisions. And one of Damasio's patients suffered lesions in the part of the brain that processes emotion. And they were not super smart. They were incapable of making decisions because they didn't know what they wanted. And so the, the fundamental factor is that the things deep in our brain, which are the emotional parts, assign value to things. And what we have to do in life is not only think rationally, but before that, we have to educate our emotions through poetry, music, sports. And the more you make your emotional responses subtle and widen the repertoire of your emotions, the more rational you're going to be, not less. Now, I, I should explain that, uh, that your, the current book, The Social Animal, the new book, uh, in it, uh, you, you create a fictional couple and, and their parents and trace them through their lives. And, and uh, uh, as things happen, you cite the neuroscientists and the psychologists and the sociologists and the, explaining what's going on and how these people are really acting in ways that are far more, um, well, far less out of their immediate conscious control than we might think, and the point being that describes us. Uh, when we talked about the book, uh, I asked you how this had affected your reporting as you'd increasingly been moved to write this through seeing the failure of much more rational actor models of how we, how we behave. So if we were to very carefully uh, you know, read your, mine your columns uh, over the past decade. Uh, would, would we see you actually writing about politics and, and conservatism differently, say, 10 years ago than now, as you've, as you've become more immersed in, in this? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it grew out of policy failures. Uh, I, you know, I covered the Soviet Union, which was probably the best story I ever covered. And we sent teams of economists into Russia. And they, uh, we, we armed them with privatization plans and hard currency plans, assuming their fundamental problems were all economic. But the fundamental problem there was a lack of social trust, which meant they stole everything. And so we'd, we were oblivious to that. So covering that, I said, you know, we're missing the core problem. Then in Iraq, which was a big trauma for a lot of us, uh, you know, we sent the military uh, and uh, were oblivious to the psychological effects of living and the cultural realities uh, of Iraq. And I once asked a senior member of the Bush administration, I can't tell you who she was, but uh, it was, uh, <laughs> uh, and I said, didn't you guys kind of get the culture of Iraq wrong? And this person said, um, well, I don't really believe in this mushy thing called culture. I think if you change institutions, you change the culture. And that is actually the right political science answer, mm -hmm. but it happens not to be the right one. And then so I would say in the last couple months or years, the financial crisis, mm -hmm. if, you, if you're immersed in this work, it does not surprise you that bankers are not prudent, rational creatures that will always ask, are, act intelligently. Because you see how uh, emotional contagions can sweep through a profession and cause people to misprice risk at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then, then if you cover this stuff, you'll see uh, how, much, how an emotional contagion can sweep through the Middle East and cause them to change perceptions. But then fundamentally, the, the thing that has really affected, well, there are two areas that affected my column the most. One is 
different thinking about density. I wrote a book about the suburbs, celebrating the fast growing suburbs. Now I appreciate the importance of density, face to face communication. I cite in the book a University of Michigan study. They took one group of people, uh, gave them 10 minutes to solve a math problem, and said you can do it face to face. They gave other groups 30 minutes to solve the problem. They said you have to communicate by email. So group A with the face to face easily solved the math problems. Group B by email could not solve them because so much of our communication is face to face by intonation of voice and things like that. And if you look at patent uh, results, when people submit a patent application, they submit all the other patents that contributed to their innovation. And an astounding number of these were invented by inventors who lived within 25 miles of the original person. We, live from, we learn from the people we are right around. So importance of density. And then the final thing, which is most important to me, is human capital formation. Mm -hmm and that we, we tend to um, emphasize when we're raising our kids or thinking about human capital, we think about years in school, grades, SAT scores, professional skills. But the things that really matter are your ability to establish a connection with a teacher, your ability to control your impulses, your ability to establish social relationships with peers, to feel emotionally connected to an institution. All those things are trained unconsciously. But you're using culture here uh, interchangeably. With, yeah. with the phenomena that you're, that you're describing. We don't examine culture by using MRIs or, or, by, or maybe, maybe we will someday, or you know, by taking a survey. Uh, is, is that the same thing that you're talking about? Yeah. Or are you talking about something more, more hardwired into us, into our psychology? Right. Now, now, well, I, I d don't think there's a distinction. We have one of the big findings of the research is how much of our processing goes on unconsciously. And so the human mind can take in about 12 million pieces of information a minute, of which it can be consciously aware of 40. And so how do we process all that stuff unconsciously? Some of it, some of the information that helps us come process it is comes through genetics. And that's information that comes to us from thousands of years ago. But I don't think that's fundamentally different than the information that came to us from hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago, which we call culture. And so we're, we're not aware of the many ways culture shapes our perceptions. A couple quick experiments. Somebody had the bright idea of looking at people having coffee in different cultures around the world and looking how often the people having coffee reached across the table and touched each other affectionately while they were talking. And in Rio, I think there were 180 touches an hour. And in Paris, I think there were 120 touches an hour. And in London, there were zero touches an hour. <laughs> and so we don't think about that. but there's, uh, And then the other, another quick experiment, they took a look, pick, look at people from around the world looking at the Mona Lisa and they measured their eye saccades, the little eye movements we use to scan. And people from China, their eyes were going all up and down the picture. And people from the US, our eyes were looking at the eyes and the mouth of the Mona Lisa and nothing else. Uh, and so we, we scan the world differently based on culture, but it's all unconscious. So there are a lot of different yeah. flows into the unconscious. But you know, the, the, um, the implicit menace uh, in, in the more sophisticated we get in terms of, of social science and and studies about what, what determines how we'll behave, uh, is it, 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 it's a threat to the liberal instinct uh, that we are all perfectible uh, and that we are all equally capable of achieving great things. If indeed, if we attribute so much to our culture, uh, to our, you write a good deal about parenting, how we've related to our parents in our, in our first few months, uh, the impulse to, to, to track, to profile, to slot uh, young people into a future becomes that much greater and supported by science. Respond. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the, the science puts bounds on free will. There's limits to it, but it doesn't go away, in part because, as I mentioned, we have the power to educate our emotions. Uh, we have the power to, to decide what context we're going to live in. We can join the Marines or go to college, and we won't be aware of how those institutions shape us, but they will shape us. We choose our environment. And then, most importantly, the brain is incredibly plastic all through life. And so one of the things that I dwell on in the book is uh, scientists at the University of Minnesota did this fantastic longitudinal study and found they could take kids at 18 months, see how they, were look at how they related to mom, and they could predict with 77% accuracy who's going to graduate from high school. Because if at 18 months you've established a two-way relationship with mom, you not only have that relationship, you have a model in your head for how to establish relationships. So when you go to school, you'll know how to establish a relationship with teacher, and you just have a huge advantage. Uh, but nonetheless, but nothing that happens at 18 months or 20 years or 40 years or 60 years locks you in. We, if you, they have a mentor at age 10, 
that can make up for early deficiencies. Mm -hmm. And so all through life, even up to age 70, the brain is creating new neurons and experience is having an effect. So it, it limits free will, but it, uh, it certainly doesn't, you know, did I say something? I don't know whether some neurons that it. <laughs> it's up to 90, by the way. 90 is the, the new 70? I, in fact, the, uh, there's, a, there's, a, <laughs> there's a Proust, uh, when he was dying, um, got up from his deathbed, or actually didn't, couldn't get up, but he dictated a new death scene in one of his books because he said, ah, oh, this is how it is. Uh, and he wanted to re 